that uh, the ones that she thought was her parents turned out that they weren't her parents. To understand the whole story, I don't think I would be able to uh, describe that to you and uh, explain that in any terms that uh, you would be able to follow through and that I would be able to tell you accurately or not. But somehow or another, to make a long story short, she got a DNA hair sample from some kin to Elvis Presley. And whenever the DNA sample come back, it appeared that they were connected in the family. There was a connection. Not too many years before that, there was a uh, doctor who claimed to be basically that he said that Elvis Presley was a patient of his. And he had been seeing Elvis for some time, I suppose. And that Elvis was living under a name, Jesse. The fellow by the name of Jesse donated some hair for DNA sample to the lady who wanted to know more about her family. And whenever the DNA hair samples come back, they said this man is not your father because evidently she had thought that maybe Elvis was her father. But he does appear to be kin to you. From what we can tell, we believe that he is your half-brother. This lady had found a man who said, who was said to be Elvis Presley, who was living under the name of Jesse, was her half-brother in the year 2008. This would tell us that Elvis is still alive. There were also... Something happened with this that had never happened before at that time. Up till that time, there had been lots of people who made claims about Elvis. That he was their father, that in family. And of course, we all remember there was even books that come out that said Elvis is still alive. But this claim was different because the court opened back up. She had a lawsuit against the Presley Company. And... In doing so, the court opened back up this, and it was actually broadcast on Fox News, and they said that this was huge because never before had the court system been willing to open anything up about the Elvis Presley estate. Well, I've got to be honest, news time since 2008 is long since gone, and honestly, I don't guess much come of it because I haven't heard much more about it since that time. But I can tell you one thing, there's been a lot of speculation that Elvis is still alive. We've all heard it at some time or another, haven't we? And you know, the thing about this, if it, if it really is true that Elvis is still alive, then his death was a great hoax upon America, wasn't it? And whenever I, I think about that, and I, I think, is that really possible that, that someone could pull such a hoax? And You know, if you read it, you read things like you're working for the CIA, and it, it's pretty, pretty amazing to read about today. If, if they could pull a hoax like that over America, and there's always, and you know, that was just one thing I looked at. Do you know, you guys, how many of you guys... Physically, I mean, didn't watch it on video later, but actually saw the moon landing. There's several in here that saw the moon landing. Would you believe that today there are still conspiracy theories that say the moon landing was a hoax? We've never really been to the moon. It was all done in a studio, cameras and photography. Now, those conspiracy theorists, they have decided the lighting can't be right and the shadows were all wrong. There was all kinds of reasons why that there's no way that man actually landed on the, on the moon and it was all done in a studio. If, if man hasn't been to the moon and NASA has never done anything but just travel outside of, uh, of our, I don't know, world a little bit, 
then that was one of the greatest hoaxes ever played on mankind, wasn't it? If that was really true. I don't know about you, it's got me wondering. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, then the greatest hoax of all mankind has been played upon man. You see, this would be not one that's just in our generation. There's all kinds of those little conspiracy theories. But this would be one that has been passed down through the ages that people have literally given their lives for if Jesus didn't raise from the dead. There's a scripture over in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Luke. And it's in Luke, the 24th chapter. Now, whenever you read the 24th chapter of Luke, you are reading about the resurrection. But there's this little part in here. A part that we can start and look at, say in about verse 25. But basically, Jesus' close followers, the apostles and a few others, have all met together. And the word is that Jesus is raised from the dead, but they're not really for sure if this is really true. Some are witnesses, yet there's confusion. There was these guys, and they were walking along on a road known as Emmaus. And there was someone else with them, and they didn't recognize who that it was. Now, I want you to read with me in verse 25 for a moment here. And it says, And he said to them, the fellow who they were not sure about who was with them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary... For the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, Jesus himself was talking to them, but they didn't recognize Jesus. In fact, it's said that they didn't recognize Jesus until he broke bread with them. And whenever, they, 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 whenever he broke bread, it says they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Then they knew who it was. They knew it was Jesus. But up till that point, they're just wandering around with this fella. And this fella, who is Jesus, who we know it's Jesus, he begins to explain to them... That this Jesus, everything that happened to him was told about it in the Old Testament. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. Now, whenever we look in the Old Testament, there's not much question about his death. Nobody has any trouble finding that. But it's about his resurrection that some have wandered around in the Old Testament trying to understand exactly where does it say it in the Old Testament that Jesus needed to raise from the dead. Because some have thought, even in the New Testament, there was those who, who Paul had to deal with who were convinced that not, not physically, not, not that. Some were convinced this whole resurrection thing, that that part was just nonsense. But Jesus said it was spoken about and needed to take place. Now, I'd like for you to go with me to John, the 19th chapter. This is found to basically the same thing in every gospel. Not much else is different said from one to another. But there's a little part in verse 39 that's kind of different in John's account than it is in the others, because John brings up somebody that the others didn't talk about, and his name's Nicodemus. And the first time we would see Nicodemus is all the way back in chapter 3. But it said in verse 39, it said, Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, that was in chapter 3, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and a, about a hundred pounds weight. I don't know exactly how they did their burials with spices and stuff. And I know those ladies were going to come back the next day and do more. Because that's one of the reasons they were heading to the tomb. But whenever 
that Nicodemus comes along, evidently these spices in a very large quantity are put in there with the body. There is absolutely, positively, no reason for us to believe that Jesus wasn't dead. He was taken down off that cross. In fact, if you'll remember, the soldiers even went to see if Jesus was still living because it was the day of preparation, the day before the Passover. Now that's a little confusing because it appears that Jesus partook of the Passover meal. But if you look between the Gospels, you'll find out that this is a complicated subject in understanding completely. But know this, by the time of Jesus, it's thought that they were celebrating the Passover maybe two days because of the great number of people that was coming to Jerusalem. I personally don't know. But I have little doubt that the meal that Jesus celebrated that he instituted the Lord's Supper was the Passover because I'm sure it was. They wanted to get Jesus off that cross. And they went around and they were going to break some legs. Remember that? But there was a prophecy that said not a bone in his body would be broken. So they didn't do that to Jesus. But do you remember something about a soldier going up into his side there? And remember what come forth? Wasn't it water and blood? But they reported back, the Romans reported back that he was dead, didn't they? There was no question really that Jesus had died. Now, the only reason that I tell you that is because some believe there's a theory out there that says Jesus never actually died. He just basically, his body like shut down into a coma, and then three days later they found him. Now, I want you to think about that for the second, versus what we're told that what Jesus looked like plus what they should have seen. If Jesus had never actually died, if he just went into some kind of little coma and then three days later woke up, he would look pretty rough, wouldn't he? Now, I remember that I think he still had because uh, someone wanted to see, didn't they? His hands and his feet, remember that part? But I don't think the rest of him looks so rough anymore. And secondly, if you'd been beat down like Jesus was three days later, you'd probably be laying around trying to recover not doing all the things that Jesus did. Do you realize that at one time Paul records that Jesus was seen by over 500 people? And then Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, says about that event that most of those people were alive to that day and Corinthian letter was written somewhere around 50 A.D. I want you to go over to Matthew 28. Usually whenever we're in Matthew 28, we're looking at the Great Commission. But we're going to back up just a little bit. I want you to go to verse 11. This is after Jesus is raised from the dead. But they're trying to put this all together in their mind. And let's look at verse 11 here, what what had happened. And I want you to realize that the Pharisees, the the Jewish leaders, were really concerned about the fact that the, the... the apostles that the followers of Jesus would do something with Jesus' body. Because they had declared that this Jesus had said that uh, this temple uh, I I would destroy in in three days and build it back. And he was talking about himself. And they were were saying that, hey, Jesus, he's talked about a resurrection. And they said "Those, those disciples of his will try to do something to make it look like it actually happened. Verse 11, chapter 28. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard came to the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if it should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story has been widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Now, 
here it tells us in one of the in, in amongst the four gospels the resurrection is recorded in every single gospel but here it tells us clearly Matthew indicates that there was something else there was another plot that was going on besides the truth and he says that these guards were paid money to tell a different story and he said it was widely circulated till that day Acts chapter 2, if you'll go with me there. We're going to go down to verse 27. Now, probably a lot of you guys, whenever you're reading this, you have capital letters in your Bible there. Those capital letters are telling you that that's an Old Testament statement being brought forth in the New Testament. Now, maybe you don't have, but a lot of Bibles try to capitalize things that are brought forth from the Old Testament. It says, Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now, let me stop there for a moment. Peter's speaking. And he's speaking about Jesus. And what he is attempting to do is to show the people there, the Jews, that Jesus has raised from the dead. Now he himself, he's seen it. He knows that he's raised from the dead. In fact, he's even seen Jesus eat. He knows it's been a physical resurrection from the dead. But here he begins to try to explain it to those who are there... And he goes and he, he quotes this verse, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he was, we know that. In verse 27, he says, Because you will not abandon my soul in, to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay, or see corruption. This verse here came out of the Psalm, chapter 16, and verse 10. It was a Psalm by David. Up till this point, it must have been pretty confusing about exactly what that meant. But he says, you will not abandon my soul to Hades. Now, if you go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's not going to read exactly like that. You're going to have something like this. Now, you will not abandon my soul to the grave. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol. It's going to have one of those two things it would be a very odd text that would say Hades. Let me explain to you why that is. The word Hades is hados. It's a Greek word. But it wasn't just a Greek word per se that Jesus talked about and was used in this sense, but it was a place about the underworld. It was a word highly connected and this bothers some people, with Greek mythology. In fact, not only was Hades a place, but it was also a person in Greek mythology. Now, there was also even a deeper part of the underworld in Greek mythology. It's kind of like there, there's the, the stories and how they came together, and then there was the stories below the stories, and there was a place called Tartarus in those place. It was really the bad place, the abode of the dead. But this place, Hadas, was the place of disembodied spirits. In the Old Testament, there was another word, Sheol. The word Sheol wasn't as fancy as Hades. It meant grave, the pit. The Jews didn't seem to be sure about the afterworld. They were just to see people, they were in the grave. Whatever that is, the pit. Now, in the New Testament, by the New Testament time, Greek mythology was strong. And in doing so, we see that there's a new world appear, or a new word that appears for this afterworld, and it's this Hadas world word. 
Now, Jesus is said to be, by Peter, not abandoned in Hades. Nor will your Holy One undergo corruption or decay. In other words, his body was not to decay, and he was not to be abandoned there. Something was going to change. Now, I want you to follow on down here in chapter 2 of Acts, because Peter keeps talking about it. Go with me to verse 29. He says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Some have heard me talk about this on the evening service. There was a tomb that they had that they said was David's tomb. I suppose, I can't believe, I don't understand why they would think otherwise. Peter was pointing out something that was obvious to them. He said, look, David is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. You all can see his tomb. He was making a point. He was trying to get them to understand that this psalm was not about David, but it was about Jesus. Now, I want you to keep going with me here in verse 30. And so, because he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to the seat of one of the descendants on his throne. In verse 31, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. The part of scripture that everybody claims is not there, Peter says it was from the very first message. You see, what he's trying to get people to understand is that Scripture was not about David. He said, David is both dead and buried. In verse 34, he says, David has not yet ascended to heaven, but Jesus did. Whenever we look at the Scripture in 31, he says it was about Jesus. That not only did the Old Testament foretell of his death, of his burial but it also foretold of his resurrection. There are those who say that Jesus didn't do anything else but fulfill prophecy. In other words, he knew what the Old Testament said, and all he did is go through his life fulfilling the prophecies. Well, there's some he's pretty good at, such as the whole virgin birth thing. I don't know how Jesus pulled that one off to start with. He must have been thinking way ahead, wasn't he? There are others that I would find difficult. Some of his miracles that he performed and things like that. But whenever we just look at prophecy and we begin to look at the, the Old Testament and begin to look at the prophecy and we begin to say that Jesus just kind of wandered through the Old Testament and fulfilled this, there have been people who have done some math on this. And actually, it's for about eight of the prophecies to be fulfilled about Jesus, for him to be able to do what he said he did. He, he did. It's something to the 10th power, but that's too confusing for me. So they put it in simpler terms. So let me put it in simpler terms to you. If we had silver dollars, which I don't think I have any, but if we had silver dollars, and we had silver dollars, and we stacked them, two feet deep in this room. Well, actually, let's change that for a minute. Let's not just stack them two feet deep in this room. Let's stack them two feet deep across the state of Texas. That's pretty big, isn't it? Now, we go out and we take one of those silver dollars and we mark it. And it's pitched among the whole state of Texas, silver dollars, two feet deep. And you are told, go out in the state of Texas, wander through, and you got one chance to pick up the silver dollar with a mark on it. That's the odds of Jesus fulfilling eight prophecies as he did. Do you know how many he fulfilled according to those who go and record from the Old Testament? Over 300. 
over 300. You see, our, our thoughts of this being an accident are far beyond that because it's, it's no accident that Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies that we did, and I have no idea how many, uh, uh, you know, how many that would be there that he would be fulfilling. I mean, how many silver dollars? I don't, I don't know. That would be a bunch. Somebody count that and see if you can figure that out for us before we get out of service today. Stay off your iPhones, though. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. Jesus had a little prophecy, too, that he shared about his resurrection and his death. The people wanted a sign, especially the leaders. Jesus said this, And he answered them and said, You evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign... And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a sea monster, and we think of that often as a well, but it was a fish of sorts, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said that the book of Jonah declared that he would not remain in the grave. Basically, you know the story of Jonah, right? Jonah was swallowed by a well. Jonah was spit up by a well. He used that story to illustrate his resurrection, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He said it was right there amongst the Old Testament prophets. And it got me thinking, if that's true, I wonder how many other things are listed just the same way in the Old Testament. I want you to go to Hosea 6.2. And I realize Hosea is pretty well buried in the Old Testament. Maybe you find this kind of boring. Maybe you're not in all this prophecy stuff. But guys, I want you to know it's important to you and I to understand that the Old Testament talked about this long before Jesus walked on the earth. In fact, it's the Old Testament that makes Jesus who Jesus is. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. It says, he will revive us after two days, and he will raise us up on the third day. That is the only absolute straightforward prophecy about the three days, besides whenever we look at Jonah. Now, I realize whenever I read through prophecy, I've got this problem. I don't always get it. I read through the Old Testament, and I don't don't understand what that's talking about there. But then it's amazing, whenever you look at what the Jews were waiting on, you find out that they had managed to decipher so much of this prophecy. I want you to switch thoughts for a moment. I don't want you to think about Jesus' resurrection. I want you to think about yours. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul has some words. It goes down in verse 35, it says, But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And what kind of body do they, and, and what, and with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but the bare grain. Perhaps of wheat or something else. Paul took nature. And he talked about seeds. He's like, that seed is sown and it dies and it comes back to life. He says the resurrection was spoken of in nature. But he talks about you. He talks about me. And he talks about a resurrection. And he says that something has to die to live. I realize I've run you through the Bible quite a bit, but I I just want to take you to one more place. If you'll go over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, I will not take you anywhere else. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 
For by his wounds you were healed. This verse right here, I've got about three things marked on it. First of all, I've marked that he bore our sins in his body. He took our sins to the cross for us. Next, I've got marked so that we might die to sin. That we have to die. And the last thing I have marked is that we have to live to righteousness. You and I, we got to die. Now, I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about the old self. The old man of sin has to die. We got to crucify that man. And then we got to live. We got to live to righteousness. You see, just as Jesus died and rose to walk in a newness of life, you and I also, we have to die and be brought back to life. And just as much as it was only God who could bring Jesus back to life, it tells us in Scripture that it was by the power of God that he was brought back to life, so it is for you and me that God is the one that brings the power into our life. He brings the Spirit to your life. You know, I I realize that in so many ways, I'm trying to do a few sermons on the resurrection. And in so many ways, they're like, you know, this is just pointless. These people believe in a resurrection. But then I think about how many people in the world have tried to discourage Christians over and over and over. And how many people say that he didn't raise from the dead. Some people think the book's a hoax. Can you imagine that? Do you really think that anybody could honestly take this book and begin to study it and conclude that it was a hoax? Written over many countless years, they can't deny that. It's not like you can say, one person sat down and wrote the Bible. The stories and the threads from one to another, how could you say that this is a hoax? To say that Jesus didn't raise from the dead, would we have anything to be here for? We're here because he raised from the dead. I don't believe it's a hoax. I believe it's the truth. This morning, if you too believe it's the truth, if you believe that Jesus raised from the dead, that through the power of God he was raised from the dead, If you're ready this morning to die to self, to not live anymore for yourself, but to live for Jesus. If you're willing to confess in front of this group and in front of others that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, He lives. Then be baptized for the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let us see the old self die. And the new person live. If you have a decision to make, won't you come this morning as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation?